I want to do a poll because this is very, we did this yesterday and it was very insightful. I'm pushing up a poll. Have you personally been affected by overt? So that's just outward. Um, it could be uh, verbal aggression. It could be physical aggression, overt racism, or systemic racism. You know, where you've experienced barriers to full participation here in Canada. Yesterday, it was in two of the classes that we polled, it was hovering at around just below 50%. And today, overwhelmingly, we've got not quite double, but getting close to a two to one ratio. And that's clearly unacceptable. I mean, that's pointing. I'm really shamed by that response. But I think it's important that we see these kinds of numbers because there's often an assumption on the part of Canadians, white Canadians, to delude themselves into thinking that racism isn't really a problem in Canada. I know that I've felt that mistakenly. And clearly, in the polling that I've been doing in the last day and today, it's pointing to a very different reality. And so we have these forces at work in our society that are hurtful. And that's almost, you know, that's well more than half the class who've been hurt by this. That's not the kind of world that I want to live in. That's not the kind of country that I want to stand behind and promote. That's not a country that I can feel proud of. And so people like me need to do more. And oftentimes, I must admit, it's difficult to know how to begin. Where do you start? And uh, what, you know, once you have the, the academic tools, you understand the history. What do you do with that knowledge? And I think it turns towards activism. And I think I will stop on that word because we have a very special guest in the person of artivist, and I will let Quentin explain what that is. Uh, we have artivist Quentin Versetti here with us today. I just want to say I had to write a list down because he's got qualifications that are a mile long. Quentin is a writer. He's a musician, a performer. He is, as I said earlier, an artivist who uses art to drive social change. Quentin Afrofuturist, I'll let him explain that. He's an educator, he's a community builder, a leader. Quentin is a truth teller, he's a multiple award winner, and he's the co-founder of the Black Speculative Arts Movement. Quentin is a close friend and a genuine caring soul with a strong moral and spiritual grounding. The work that he does is all aimed at making this place better for us all. And I'll tell you from the bottom of my heart, my own life has been greatly enriched for having had the good fortune of having shared a little tiny slice of the road of life with Quentin. He was recently won the honor of commemorating the life of escaped African slave Joshua Glover in a statue that will be installed at the Montgomery, the Montgomery Inn Museum in Etobicoke. So please give a great big warm virtual George Brown welcome to artivist Quentin Versetti. There, you're getting the you're getting the love now, Quentin. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, first of all, greetings, Wagwan, bonjour. Uh, I'm Quentin Versetti, and I am honored to speak with everyone here. I speak to y'all from Indigenous lands, and I speak to you in the name of my ancestors, and uh, in honor of all those who have come before me. And um, yeah, today in all my bodies, I'm feeling truly blessed and honored. This is a, a huge honor because I was a student of Mr. Jim Kenny and he also deeply impacted my life and also changed my perspective um, on a lot of different things, but mainly on, on allyship and what that truly means in the sense of someone seeing me not just for who I was or where I was coming from or from the circumstances that I came from, or how I represented myself, but truly seeing the potential in me and allowing me to uh, make the decision to see that potential, actualize that potential, um, rather than forcing me, you know, because sometimes, you know, uh, people will see something in someone and push them 
to, to see that for themselves versus allowing that person to see that for themselves. Um, and so thank you, Mr. Jim Kenny. Um, you know, you have made a big impact on allowing me to be where I am today. So um, today I want to speak about imagination because a lot of my work is about the imagination and uh, spiritual connection. I know uh, some people might relate spiritual connection and imagination to uh, certain type of definitions. And I want to just emphasize that everything I share is of my own opinion and feel free to ask me questions. Feel free to uh, challenge me on them. I will uh, respectfully answer or decline to answer, which is still an answer. Yeah, I'm all about conversation. So I don't want to take up too much space because I want to engage because I want to make sure what I'm saying is being understanded and overstanded, as we like to say in my culture, I'm of Jamaican descent. So it's not enough to understand something, right? Because when you're under it, that means you're being influenced by it. So when you're over it, you now can actually do something with it. So we want you to overstand and understand within yourself. And so I want to start with this clip by Sun Ra, a film that I saw actually the, around the same time I met Mr. Jim Kenny. My story is one where I came from a certain scenario where I was in a neighborhood called Rexdale in uh, the west end, northwest end of Toronto, where we weren't given a lot of options. You know, uh, it was a very disenfranchised neighborhood, um, and there was a lot of drugs in my neighborhood, and a lot of, um, and because of the drugs and the poverty in my neighborhood, because we didn't have access to certain resources, and it's also what you would consider it's kind of like a, a economical desert in the sense of the opp opportunity to, to actual jobs, careers, was really rare unless you're doing agency work, which is oftentimes uh, warehouse work or construction. But the issue was, it's a desert in the sense of access from Rexdale at the time when I was growing up to the industrial areas and, and the larger economy was really difficult because you had to take at least few buses just to get to Kipling Station and just to get downtown or to get to certain areas of the city. So we were very remote and it actually was considered one of the murder capitals for many years in terms of uh, the leading wards for crimes um, bigger than Jane and Finch um, and bigger than other places in the city. And because of the poverty and such young um, demographic, we still have the highest, uh, highest crime, one of the highest crime rates and also one of the big largest uh, youth demographic with, I think, up to 60 or 70 percent of the population is under the age of 40. And Rexta also has a lot of halfway houses, which is, uh, if you don't know what halfway houses are, it's basically um, when you're released from prison and you don't have anywhere to go and you are kind of like under house arrest or you're under probation, this is where you'll go. So there's a lot of reoffenders that live in the area or, or felons. But if you have no resources and only thing access to you, is criminal activities, then you're bound to reoffend. And so um, I found myself caught up at a young age, at the age of 12, actually younger than that, at the age of nine, being caught up into this world where a lot of my older cousins were involved in gangs and, and in certain activities where by default I, I joined into those things. And so at a young age, I thought that's all I could be. Long story short, I dropped out of high school at the age of 16 and I was on the streets for a bit where there was an incident where a close friend of mine got right beside me. Like I was at a party and he got he got shot and um and because I was a witness to the to the crime there was like a fair well actually I was accused actually by the police of being involved in his murder and that was a whole situation where I was being targeted because I wasn't cooperating with the police but also there was just all this issue of like yo he saw what who what happened who did it so there was this fear overall by my family and and just in this and, and everything of me also being the next person to be killed and so my mom sent me away to New York to go to school there. And it didn't make any difference because uh, that's where actually I would, I would say I experienced the most racism because it was one, I'm like this Toronto kid who thinks he's a gangster, the skinny little scrawny uh, Toronto kid who thought he was a gangster in New York. And this is upstate New York, like Albany, Syracuse, which is like also prison cities. Those were some of the larger prisons are outside of other than Rikers Island. And so there's some pretty serious people over there. And um, yeah, and the school that I went to just like didn't make the cut for me. But it also allowed me to see who I truly was and what I wanted to be. And I realized art was my way out in the sense of actualizing my potential. And so while I was there in New York, I came across this movie by Sun Ra. And I want to play a quick clip for you guys. Oh man, this man is gonna run out on me. Last, that's a trip still. You gotta stop. It's not worth it at all. All right, take it over, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> 
Greetings, black youth, planet Earth. What it is, what it is. I am Sun Ra, ambassador from the intergalactic regions of the Council of Outer Space. Why are your shoes so big? Are those moon shoes? How do we know you for real? Yeah, how do we know you ain't somebody off Telegraph Street, some old hippie or something? <laughs> <laughs> what are you? I mean, we don't know that. She for real? He might have something going for him. Yeah, we showed them. Well, what kind of shoes is that you got on your feet? Yeah, walking around all these funny clothes. Shoot, I know I'd probably take off running. I seen somebody walking down the street coming, talking all that mess to me, talking about going to outer space. What is that? How do you know I'm real? Yeah. I'm not real. I'm just like you. You don't exist in this society. If you did, your people wouldn't be seeking equal rights. You're not real. If you were, you'd have some status among the nations of the world. So we're both Myths. I do not come to you as a reality. I come to you as the myth, because that's what black people are. Myths. <laughs> I came from a dream that the black man dreamed long ago. I'm actually a present sent to you by your ancestors. I'm going to be here till I pick out certain one of you to take back with me. What if we won't come? You gonna make us come? Then I'm gonna have to do you like they did you in Africa. Chain you up, take you with me. Are there any whiteies up there? They're walking there today. That's right. She tells you right. They take frequent trips to the moon. I notice none of you have yeah. been invited. How do you think you're gonna exist? The year 2000 is right around the corner. What's that crystal thing in your hand? So Sun Ra uh, is, a, is from the future where um, black people ended up, because of the condition in the world, they ended up deciding like, you know what, we're better off on a whole different planet doing a whole, our own thing, but only the people with the highest frequency. So on Saturn, they start to flourish. And the idea was, he's like, you know what, let me go back in time or go back through time and space because time has collapsed in accordance to uh, African traditions, the past, present and future are course correlate and let me help to raise the frequency of those who didn't want to leave planet earth in in order to help them see the potential and so in that clip he's dressed all funky with like these egyptian tology type inspired um clothing and he they're like man like you're you're not real and he's like yeah i'm just like you you're not real and he's like you know if, if you were real you wouldn't be fighting for your status in the world you wouldn't be fighting for human rights you wouldn't be fighting you would have your own nation you would be recognized as humans and, and, and people and would have your own history that's not linked to oppression and he's like you know what i'm just like you i'm a myth i don't exist i'm a legend and so throughout the movie he goes on to try to demystify the myth of blackness and black people and people of African descent and people of color not existing, but making sure they realize that they exist to themselves. Once you acknowledge that you exist, then then it's easier or it's less of a challenge. Let me not say easier, but then it's less of a challenge to then allow other people to see your existence. Because what has happened through slavery is that, or the enslavement of humans from Africa, is that they weren't seen as human beings, right? They were seen as child. And so the reason that related to the imagination for me was because I was seeing myself being limited to a certain situation. I thought all I could be is an athlete or a drug dealer or, you know, a criminal of some sort. Whereas I started to see myself more and start to see my own potential for myself. And so, yeah, it's been a 10 year need of growth of reimagining and demystifying this idea of not existing and exploring the different ways that can exist and exploring the different ways that can continue to reach for the stars in a lot of ways and so i want to start off with showing you this collection of my business cards and every year so i came back so for a jump into my story too far i came back from the states in 2009 roughly end of 2008 going into 2009 
And that's when I enrolled back into high school. And basically, I realized I wasn't dumb. I was hustling in the States. I was making money. I was doing a lot of different things, but I realized I was actually smart. And it was just because of like, the different people I was meeting. I realized I had people skills. I realized I was really social. I realized I was artistic. I realized I was poetic. I realized I could rap. I realized I could make music. And I was like, yo, this whole time, I was told I was stupid, and I'm not dumb. I was like, you know what? Let me at least get my high school diploma. Now, when I was 18 years old, I decided to get back into high school. And the school I enrolled in was called Nelson A. Boylan, which sadly no longer exists. It was one of the schools that got closed down. But there was a fast track program that I was able to be a part of that allowed me to get double the amount of credits, basically. One of the programs I got involved in was called Dual Credit, which allowed me to go to George Brown and get a high school credit and a college credit. And this was a big deal for me because, again, it expanded my imagination of my potential and of who I could be. Because I never in my, ever in my life thought about going to university or into any post-secondary institution because one, not to say I didn't have the money, but I didn't have the, I didn't see the value in it. And at the time when I came back to Toronto, I didn't have the money. And so I was just like, yo, there's no way I'm going to pay thousands of dollars someone to tell me what to do, you know? Because in my mind, I'm, a, I'm my own boss, I'm my own man, et cetera, et cetera. And so the dual credit program really changed my perspective on post-secondary because I thought it was this place for elitists and for white people. And I kid you not, at the time in my neighborhood, I grew up literally, like my whole building, it's like six floors and it's about a thousand units. It's a, it's a complex and it's all black folks. So I never really had any bl- like friends who weren't black. And so... Going to George Brown was like a shock. Even my school, Nelson A. Boylan, was, was predominantly black. There was like black and, and, and Arabs. Um, and when I say black, I mean like people from the continent. There's a lot of Somalis and West African folks from Ghana and Nigeria, a couple of Senegalese people, and then a lot, of, a lot of Caribbean folks, a lot of folks from Jamaica. But then also I met black Canadians, which was like, I was like, whoa, there's a thing called black Canadians? Like you guys, y'all been here? Y'all folks been here like for hundreds of years? crazy and so yeah going to george brown was a shock for me like the the dual credit program for me was a shock because i was really like suspect of every every person who was not black that was actually willing to help me you know and actually was willing to see me as me even though i didn't know who me was at the time the dual credit program i started in 2010 and that's where i met mr jim kenny and eventually i was able to um he saw the potential in me and asked me to be his teaching assistant his student assistant and that's also where i really started to flourish in terms of exploring the medium of graphic design and digital applications and learning different programs I just realized i had this whole hunger for knowledge and just really wanted to expand my creative expression. And so my first business card came out of George Brown and going into the Remix Project, which was a youth program. And so essentially, once my imagination started to expand, I started to look at the different connections, the different ways that I was being limited and placing limits on myself and how can I break out of those limits. And I was looking at solutions, looking at the different creative ways that I can create solutions and not create excuses, essentially. Graphic design really helped me with that because it made me realize like my creative body and my creative self has no limits. Even if, God forbid, the KKK popped up, they can't stop me from being creative. Even if I was thrown in prison, I could never be stopped. No one can stop my creativity. Jay-Z said an amazing line. He's like, trap my body, but can't lock my mind you know, or trap my body, but you can't, you know, lock my soul. And that really resonated with me, you know. And so that's when I started to get really interested in this idea of Afrofuturism and exploring self, you know, and really starting to invest in myself. And so over the years, as my style developed and, and evolved, I was like, yo, I want to reflect this in, in the, my business and, and how I, I present myself to people. So every time they meet me and I give them, even if I saw them already, even if they already know me, I'm giving them a new business card to let them know this is another person you're dealing with. This is an involved person that you're dealing with. This is not the same person you dealt with before because it's also then changing your imagination of me. And so, yeah, each year I started to build upon the, the previous year and the, and the work continued to grow and grow. And so I'm going to speak more about my work and how it relates to, I guess, essentially the foundation of Black Lives Matter and Afrofuturism and larger ideas. And feel free to um, post questions and I'll, I'll try to answer them as we go. As Mr. Jim Kenny said, one of the founders of the Black Speculative Arts Movement. And I, came, I got involved in that around 2014, where I realized I was really knee deep into Afrofuturism. And Afrofuturism on a basic level is speculative, or imaginative representation and storytelling about people of African descent inspired 
by African culture, histories, people, tradition, and land and resources. Afrofuturism has now expanded as a movement and as a theoretical way of thinking beyond just the future. It's also speaking about reimagining the past and also reimagining the, the present. So example of this is, uh, rest in peace, Chadwick Boseman as a Black Panther. That movie is an example of Afrofuturism because it reimagined Africa, past, present. The movie is not taking place in the future. It's taking place actually in the year that we're living in, right? It's contemporary. But everything that we saw in it was speculative. Everything that we saw in it was imaginative based on African concepts. So everything in the movie was based on tribes and actual history from Africa. So the idea of like a, a place that was never colonized in Africa was based on Ethiopia and also Liberia. But, but Liberia is a different story, but Ethiopia specifically, and how Ethiopia was one of the first modern countries in Africa. And then et cetera, et cetera, the heart-shaped herb, the vibranium represents, you know, the metaphors of bauxite and all the different precious metals that is being currently exploited from Africa. Et cetera, et cetera. Even the costumes were inspired and everything. I got really in interested in this world of Afrofuturism, but I was like, I want to see what other people think. Because I realized I was coming about it from a very Caribbean, pan-African and Caribbean perspective. And I wanted to know, like, what is unique? And a lot of the Afrofuturism at the time that was coming out and the representation that was coming out was coming specifically from America. And I was like, yo, like, there's the imbalance, you know what I mean? There's an imbalance of, like, expression because blackness is not only limited to america and it's not a monolith and so it was important for me to create a platform where other people can then have a conversation because one thing that post-secondary taught me and being at george brown and then also then later on going to ocad university was the academia world is about conversation it's a tool to be in conversation with those who came before you and those who might come after you. And it's like a conversation of how can we build upon previous knowledge? And so to me, I was like, oh, that's pretty Afrofuturistic. But within the post-secondary or the, within the academia world, I realized there was a very limited conversation around visual arts and a conversation amongst artists and their works. And so what I wanted to do was look at public art and how art is accepted. I realized art was art from an imaginative standpoint of both of black people by black people for black people was not being showcased enough and was not being um, highlighted enough and i realized there was all these systemic issues at the ago with the rom i found out about the rom hard into the heart of africa exhibit that happened in 1990 and the rights that took place after that and, and the protesting that took took place after that because of that and i learned about like you know the, the something similar that happened at the ago where they represented a, a really skewed and, and racist perspective about Black people from a colonial gaze without having Black people's input. I found it really important to want to um, represent and create a platform, essentially. That platform turned into Black Future Month, and Black Future Month is what led to me starting to get into conversation with people from across the world who were interested in my work and hearing about my work, and it and led into the Black Speculative Arts Movement, where I did the exhibition in New York on the anniversary of the 95th um, Harlem Renaissance anniversary in Harlem, New York at the Schomburg Research Center. From there, with the Black Future Month, going into the Black Speculative Arts Movement, we collectively realized there was a need to redefine Afrofuturism as something that was Pan-African and not just American, and then also collapsing in the idea of time, but then also speaking to using the visuals and using the movement of literature, cinema, et cetera, as a deeper commentary on what's happening in the world today. And so one of the key things for us was publishing. Dr. Ronaldo Anderson is the other founder in the States. And so he published Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astral Black. And again, that's an ode to Octavia Butler and to um, Sun Ra. And another book that I'm published in, The Cosmic Underground, a grimoire of black speculative discontent. And this was an exhibition that I was a part of in 2015 in Harlem. And I was the only Canadian in um, the exhibition next to Nala Hawkinson, who didn't exhibit any work, but she uh, has her book covers in this in this uh, catalog. And so I contributed several definitions to um, this book, The Black Speculative Arts Movement. And um, one of the key things was a definition called Sankofanology, which is 
um, again, how the past, present, and future connects based on an African concept called Sankofa. And Sankofa is represented in semiotics or as an as a icon in two ways. And one is a bird that's looking back, almost like a swan or like a goose looking back. And it, it has an egg in its mouth. And the egg represents future, represents potential, it represents um, possibilities, opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And it's reaching back for those things. And the idea is that the, the phrase is, it's not taboo to go and fetch what you have forgot. And so the other symbol is the original heart symbol. And you can look it up. You can find it on Google if you type in Sankofa, S-A-N-K-O-F-A. -A. And also there's an article that I wrote that defines Sankofa knowledge more in depth. And um, the second symbol is a heart symbol. And the heart symbol um, has twirls going inwards into the in, inside. And then on the bottom part, it twirls outwards. And it's the idea of you go into your spirit or into your ancestral space. Or if you watch Black Panther, which I definitely encourage everyone to watch it, um, the ancestral plane. So that's the spiritual space. You go into your own ancestral space, whether it's meditation, whether it's just brainstorming, et cetera, et cetera. But you're, you're going into a spiritual, into an internal place, uh, a place that's timeless, essential. And then you're taking the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding from that place and you're turning it into action. And so I, I, I had no definitions in the book. And so um, I further expanded upon a lot of my work um, of like trying to create platforms in the community and trying to um, expand the imagination of the community abroad, um, not just the black community, but also all communities of how we think about black people and that's also how we think about black people's place in the future. Um, and so this, uh, this is another book that I've been published in. But one of the main things that my work about is looking at Canadian monuments. Because I realized in Canada, when I was at OCAD actually, um, I was really intrigued by the lack of representation in the public. Like I said, I was really focused on the access to black representation and the access to art. And that's why I started to create art shows. Well, those art shows came from being able to walk around, because I went to South Africa in 2010 once I graduated, so if we're going back to my business cards. So after this part, I jumped here, and this is when I started to re-inspect myself. And I started to re-inspect myself when I went to Africa, where to South Africa specifically, and to Zimbabwe, where I was trying to find out about my African roots and, and learn about, like, you know, more about the continent and the diversity of the continent. And so, I realized everywhere I went, there was like monuments. There was, there was tributes to history everywhere. And I was like, yo, this is crazy. You know, because I never thought I would see that in Africa. Like, you know, because I was very ignorant. And, um, and I was also never, didn't, I didn't think there was going to be such a balance of, um, I guess, the, the modern um, development of cities and, and, and also a balance of rule. And the rule not being looked down upon because they realize you need the rule in order to have the maintenance of the city because one feeds the other and vice versa. And so, and then also there's a respect for, for the reverence of like those who live in, in mountains and et cetera, et cetera. You know, like everyone has their place. And so, but one of the things that was common, especially with amongst the Kosa people, the Nebele people, and even, um, people was having access to see your, your, your culture represented everywhere you are. And so I realized Canada had an overall lack of monuments of people of African descent. I realized it's an act of erasure um, based on my studies, based on the conversation that I was getting into in post-secondary, based on the things I was researching, um, like Tanya Ennis and her essay. And so I realized also Toronto was the only major city in the world that doesn't have any monuments of people of African descent, and um, that there was over 200 monuments in the greater Toronto area. And I was like, yo, this is crazy, because it's like we, we boast so much about multiculturalism, but yet we don't see that in the landscape. 
And so my research was really simple. I went to the website of Toronto.ca and I looked at the public art map and I literally sat there in my undergrad in 2012. And I was like, okay, there has to be something that tells a story about black people in Toronto. Like, like where are the histories? Like, you know, where are the stories about these people? And I went through and I'm like, white people, people. I'm like, oh, snap. Okay, there's some Asian people. Okay, oh, there's some Indian folks. Like, and I'm like, okay, that's cool. But I'm like, yo, we've been here as long as the European settlers. I found out about someone named Matthew DaCosta. Um, from a show, does anyone know who Matthew DaCosta is? Does anyone know who Matthew, have anyone heard of the name Matthew DaCosta? So, and I realized that's one of the greatest, I want to say this honestly, it's one of the greatest injustice uh, in Canadian history. And the reason I say that is because Matthew DaCosta, and I'm going to try to pull up a picture. Matthew DaCosta was the translator and the original discoverer of Quebec who traveled, he traveled with uh, Samuel Duchamplain. And he was a liaison for the indigenous people and the early European settlers. And so he also was known to speak over 11 languages European languages, and it's unknown how many African languages he spoke, and it's unknown how many um, indigenous languages he spoke. But he came here to Canada in 1605. The first African slave came from, uh, that came from Africa to the Americas as, as a resident, or, or as, you know, taken from Africa, was in, sorry, no, that's not him, was uh, in 1625. So Matthew Costa came here, to Canada 20 years prior to the first slave in America. And for whatever reason, there's a bridge, there's statues of Samuel de Champlain, there's bridges and statues of and streets and parks named after uh, Pierre and, and all these uh, other French and, and English explorers, but nothing of Matthew da Costa. And what was interesting about Matthew da Costa is that he also came here with his own ship of Moors. And I don't know if anyone knows about the Moors. But the Moors were um, were the first um, people to circumference to um, to travel around the world, and they also taught um, a lot of the Spaniards. Um, and the Portuguese how to travel and create boats that could travel across the ocean, which uh, later on, they, Christopher Columbus, et cetera, et cetera, was able to travel, right, to India, et cetera, et cetera. But they already established those routes, right, because the Middle Ages, uh, the, the Dark Ages was, was when the Moors were, were pretty much running Europe, right? So also to call it Dark Ages was also racist, just if folks didn't know. So anyways, um, Matthew de Costa, came to Canada in 1605 with a ship of black folks. And he was already speaking the language of the indigenous people. So if this black man already spoke the language of the people of Canada, how could that be? That means he actually came here before Samuel de Champlain. Does that, not, does that make sense? Does that make sense to folks? Does that logic make sense? It's crazy that we're not taught about him, right? Like in black months, we're not taught about, we don't know what country he came from because he has so many different documentation. So we know that he worked for the Dutch, for the Netherlands, and for also for Holland. We also know that he worked for the Spaniards, but we don't know exactly what country he came from. It's suspected that he came from Spain because he came on the ship with Moors, and, and uh, the Moors were greatly heavily in Spain at the time. But we don't know what country he originated from. And we don't know how, and yeah, perhaps North Africa as well. We just know that he's not Arab for sure. He was definitely a dark-skinned man and um, he spoke multiple languages and very few documentation about him. 
again. And I was just looking at like the missing histories of Canada. I was like shocked. Cause when I went on the Toronto website, I'm like, yo, where is the history? Like, you know what I mean? And like, where are the representations? Like, what did these people look like? You know, what did they wear? Like, you know, like what was their histories, you know? And so I was just really shocked because again, when I went to South Africa, when I went to like different parts in Asia, when I went to different parts in South America, I just saw the history reflected in landscape a lot, but in Canada. And so essentially my work started to look at, well, I started to find plaques and plaques are not considered to be public art. So that's why they didn't show up on the map. But I found a website that documented some of the, the Toronto plaques that paid homage to the history in Toronto. And there's also other websites. But I was like, man, there's only one, two, three, four, well, George Brown doesn't count. Shout out George Brown for being an abolitionist. But well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's only ten plaques in all of Toronto. Or well, eleven plus the page I'm on. And I was like, yo, there has to be more history than that. And so I started to I started to realize that it's important for me to then tell that history. And so my work started to jump into creating monuments. I created a series of work called Outside in the Republic. And the idea of the Afrotopia, which is a play on the utopia, the Afrotopia is just basically like the ideal space for black people to exist and where they feel like they are invested in. So um, one of the first pieces I made was myself, reimagining myself at Senra. And so if I go back to the pictures of my business cards, you'll see. So if you go back to 2014, you'll see that... Um, you know, I just had to explore these ideas of monuments even further. And so I started to want to represent young people, you know, and specifically young women. But I realized there wasn't enough monuments and tribute to black women in the landscape. There's a term by Kimberly Crenshaw called intersectionality. And intersectionality is a really important term in the work of decolonization and, and anti-black racism and any of the type of work that we're trying to do to, to create social change. And intersectionality on a basic level is looking at how do different systems of oppression affect people on, on different angles. And so for black women, especially if we're talking about queer black women, if we're talking about ableism, et cetera, et cetera, black women are at the, at the largest. And if you, you, know, you want to go further, black queer, femme, trans folks are the largest intersection. And then if you want to go further, folks with, dis with different abilities, you know, different, different able bodies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so the idea of tackling social change is also thinking about sectionality. And so I wanted to start representing the idea of intersectionality in my work through using metaphors, you know. So this person who I represented at the time, she was in a wheelchair. And it's not that she was amputated or anything like that, but I wanted to play around this idea of where she felt like she was separated from her body when she was in the wheelchair. But she felt like um, music as an as a artist and stuff was the extension of her body. So as you heard me say earlier, the creative body and how I felt limitless in my creative body despite whatever oppression that I faced or, or despite whatever barriers that I, I occurred. And so I wanted to show these representations of people, young people who I know. I did 3D scans earlier and then as my skills developed, I started to do actual um, sculpting, 3D sculpting. But I wanted to show these presentations of young people in these ways because I wanted to expand their imagination of their representation. And so again, if going back to my business cards in 2016, again, expanding how I represented myself. This piece, really quick, I was on the verge of graduating from OCAD University and a teacher said to me that she felt like I was racist. The teacher said that she felt like I was racist because all I did was represent black people in my work. And I tried my best to explain, <laughs> as simple as I can, that like based on systemic power structures, black people can be discriminative, they can be prejudiced, but they can't be racist because the system of racism and the practice of racism did not originate and does not benefit black people, right? And the system and structure of racism only benefits people of European descent, specifically what we call white folks. And so within the power dynamics, I don't have any influence on any governments. I don't have any influence, et cetera, et cetera, you know? when we can go on and on. Well, I learned about Nike, the goddess of victory. I realized that she was taken from the concept from the Greeks and the Romans, was taken actually from the Yoruba culture, which came from the Yoruba, then traveled to Kemet. And then, of course, everyone, I hope everyone, that Greeks and Romans based their whole culture and existence on ancient Kemet, which was ancient Egypt, right? Because that was 10,000 years or 6,000 years prior to Rome being built and prior to Greece. They were greatly influenced by the ancient Egyptians. The column that someone just asked in the work is the reclaiming, I also went to Egypt 
and it was a reclaiming of very Afrocentric things that was now being equated to European ideas, right? So the idea of classical art, the idea of neoclassical, and always being referred to the Greeks and the Romans made no sense when the Egyptians were doing that thousands of years before them, right? And the very aesthetic that they use that we refer to as classical came from the ancient command. And again, I'm not making these things up. In my research, I went to the place and I was like, what do you mean this is 10,000 BC? Rams, what are you talking about? How could that be? You know, so it was perplexing to me, to say the least. Just going back to um, the final stuff I want to show and share with you. So my work just continued to, to be about expanding imagination and expanding representation. These are the books. So yeah, I was looking at the lack of representation of monuments, the lack of representation in Toronto, and just wanted to represent young people and represent different black people in the Canadian landscape and not even like, not even make it up because oftentimes we, we feel like we have to make it up and it's like, no, I'm just making up how I'm representing these people. Um, this is a list of all the monuments that exist in Canada and I can share this with Mr. Jim Kenny and he can share that with you. And again, none of the monuments listed here are in Toronto. We have Ottawa, we have St. Catherine, we have Chatham, we have Edmonton, we have Montreal, we have Windsor, we have St. Catherine, we have all Quebec City, Montreal, St. Catherine, Liverpool, Annapol, uh, uh, Annapolis, Royal, Nova Scotia, which is actually where Matthew de Costa landed. And I'm honored to say that, uh, yeah, 2021, I'll be creating, creating one of the one of Toronto's first monuments. But this is just a list of, as you can see, on top of my list, Matthew da Costa. So this is my short list of the Canadians who I feel like deserves to have monuments. And funny enough, Joshua Glover was not on my list, folks. He didn't even pop up on my radar. So I was just like, yo, this is crazy that this is that's the first monument that I'll be creating as Toronto's first monument when there's all these other folks who I felt like is more worthy. So I hope that's just the beginning of the work, you know? Again, just wanted to represent more women as monuments in the landscape. So this is like the idea of the Afrotopia where they can express their culture. I want to have a quick pop quiz. Does anyone know why I represented these instruments? These women playing these instruments? So we have the sangba, drum, we have the saxophone, we have, we have the kora. Well, yeah, so all of them have African origins essentially. And so again, like I said, I wanted to reclaim a lot of these iconographs of uh, what, what people think to be European, especially like the concept of a bus. And you can look it up. If you don't, like, I also encourage folks to facts check. Like, if you don't think I'm, what I'm saying is honest, or if you don't think what I'm saying is, is correct, I encourage you to fact check what I'm saying, because I also um, believe in learning through correction and also um, through conversation. And so I'm just gonna wrap this up so we can have some more um, back and forth uh, conversations and maybe Mr. Jim Kenny can jump in. I was actually excited about telling the story of Joshua Glover because it was a huge challenge because I was really trying really hard to step away from the slave narrative, the enslaved narrative. And because I realized in North America, there's a huge obsession with talking about slaves. Again, like I told you, Matthew da Costa, who was the first black person recorded in North America, was a free, command, contracted, paid man who came here with his own ship, which meant that he was also wealthy. And so I was like, why are we so caught up on the slave narrative and not speaking about these other narratives that speak about black excellence that doesn't have to do with oppression? And so the, telling the Joshua Glover story as a monument was really interesting because I was like, okay, damn, this is a challenge. How do I represent something new about the slave narrative, you know, and the enslaved African? But more specifically, how do I push the imagination of the public to see this person beyond that title, you know, because that's not, that shouldn't define who he is or his legacy. And so using Afrofuturistic lens, I wanted to show a concept of transition and transformation. And so we see uh, that he has chains around like a robotic arm because Octavia Butler in one of her books and also Joshua, um, sorry, John Jennings in uh, The Cosmic Underground spoke about black people coming to America, African people, people of African descent, coming to the Americas as machines, as robots, being seen as non-human, but instead as property, as objects, as technology for white supremacy and for white patriarchy specifically. We see that Joshua Glover goes from being a machine because that machine represents, or that robot represents slavery. And so he goes from being that machine to then becoming human. We kind of see his flesh growing. And then we see like he's wearing a tattered canvas shirt. And that canvas shirt represents that like he was a runaway 
he's running away and he's kind of like in transition and then that shirt turns into a, a suit based on the, the clothing that they would have wore at the time hence why he has uh, the mutton chops <laughs> um, and that was all based on research on based on like what he would look like and, and the things that the, a gentleman or a dandy would wear because he was working at the Montgomery Inn which was kind of like the Ritz of that day Tobacco and so that was a big deal he was one of the first black hotel managers actually in Toronto during that time period in the 1860s I wanted to show this person in transformation and transition because it really reflected my story of where I felt like I was limited and in bondage to my circumstances and then get into a point where my creativity and my hunger for knowledge and learning allow me to see my humanity and see that I wasn't just a black man seeing that I wasn't just some you know n-word or someone that just came from the hood of who made a lot of poor decisions in, in his youth but someone who was on a path to self-discovery and helping others to discover their humanity and their connection a larger uh, contribution to humanity and to this world um, while we're here it was really interesting to represent joshua glover because even though i didn't want to present another slave story or i didn't feel like toronto deserved another slave story or people need to know another slave story i was like yo it's not about a slave story it's about a human being i was like yo just that thinking of my own was a reflection of how much racism has affected the way i thought about people who look like me because that's only small blimp of our story. And really what my mission is, is to allow people to see beyond that. To see a human being, again, to see someone who it was a part of our fabric of a society and who's constantly growing, right? Like his legacy is gonna continue to, to change how we look at Toronto and, and our society as, uh, in the sense of how society has changed in the sense of what it means for this city to be one of the most multicultural cities in the world, right? And so I have these three flowers. You can't see the fourth one really well based on these angles, but we have these three flowers and it represents the places that he was. So um, from uh, St. Missouri, which is where he was enslaved, to go into Ohio, to then come into Ontario, the Ontario Trillium. And in his hat is the hibiscus flower. And the hibiscus flower is a, is a spiritual flower, but also a common flower in Africa. It's a Pan-African flower. In um, the Caribbean, we call it sorrow. And it's, it's used as tea. It's a really tasty tea. And it's also used as medicine. And so I wanted to put that flower in his hat to say that Africa, his African, his ancestors, his connection back to his roots and who he truly is, is still on top of his mind. You know, so again, for my life and think about, you know, the future uh, for my children. To, to come and the book is going to be called exported pollen from mercury this is the work in progress and i want to quickly share with you all another work in progress as we speak about this um, concept of expanding imagination as everyone knows in the world we lost a really important actor within the black community chabot bozeman and uh, he played the black panther and i'm currently working on a tribute statue for chabot bozeman and a lot of people ask me like why is chabot bozeman important and uh, Chabot Bozeman is important for so many reasons, but simply the idea of despite suffering, despite hardship, despite whatever difficulty you're going through, you have to think about a bigger picture and know that you're not going through it alone. Black Panther was amazing because it connected us to imagination, all the different possibilities of what African representation could be, all the different ways that we can imagine, reimagine Black people in positive and reaffirming ways. And Chadwick Boseman was important because he only picked roles that he knew was going to mean something positive. He only picked positive roles. And I think as an artist, as a creative, and I think a part of our fight to improve humanity is to really focus on the positive. Like social media right now, they like to really hone in on the negative. And the thing is, going back to Sun Ra, the negative lowers our frequency. Focusing on the negative is never pretty positive results we can bring up the negative statistics but then it's like let's look at the positive it's like yes i was a high school dropout but i'm now completing my master's yes i spent x amount of years involved in criminal activities but then i decided to dedicate the rest of my years to uplifting others that's a statistic five six years in the streets versus 10 years plus of traveling around the world and then and, and trying to uh, help people to see their connection to each other spiritually ancestrally and as humans and i think 
that's the main thing I want to focus on, like that human connection. And I think the reason why a lot of people are going to mourn and、um, celebrate at the same time Chadwick Boseman's life is because of the ways that he allowed us to connect to our own humanity and connect to、uh, our imagination. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you so much, Quentin. That was very powerful. I would just open the floor up to any questions. Yeah, I'm also interested to know if anyone has ever come across、uh, any Afrofuturism Nic- content. Nicholas、um, says he has a question. How long did it take you to structure the model you just made? Oh man, well, it's always a hard question when people ask me that because I don't just sit there and work on it. I, I do it in my spare time. Like I'm doing. Like there's actually another video I want to show you of stuff I'm working on. I'm right now working on a lot of augmented reality and also just exploring more in 3D printing, which I can show you. So this is the Joshua Glover piece, 3D printed. Wow. I'm also part of a residency called、um, Monument Lab and the Guta Institute as well. Just have a lot of projects on the go, so I've been dedicating at least two, three hours to the piece. So I guess collectively I've spent about ten hours since he passed away. In terms of the program、um, that I use, I use ZBrush, which is the program that I just showed you, Cinema 4D, and also After Effects, and also Adobe Illustrator as well. You can do 3D creations in in all pretty much all Adobe software, except for maybe Indesign. I do think that we should absolve. Not necessarily remove Black History Month, but I think we should absolve it because it should be included in all of our histories. In a sense of like, any time we do history class, starting from grade kindergarten all the way to the end of、uh, university, we should constantly be learning about Canadian history because just the fact that almost everyone said they didn't know who Matthew De Costa is just shows you the disservice that Black History Month is doing. I think Black History Month is not enough. That's what I'm basically trying to say. It's not enough for us to focus on 29 days. Um, 28 days sometimes. It, it needs to be year wide long. Black History Month is one of the most stressful months for me because everyone is calling you on January to do something in February, and everyone's trying to just get you to just like employ you. But then after that month ends, you're kind of discarded. I do think Black History Month is not doing enough. I think it's important to have the history stretched out because of so much, right? We talk about Black History Month because、uh, with Black History Month we often just speak about American history. Why do we know so much about Martin Luther King Jr. but we don't know about Dudley Laws, Walter Rodney? A lot of people don't even know who Marcus Garvey is. To me, that's crazy. Marcus Garvey is probably most important. Not most important. I mean, I say one person is more important than other. But I think it's important for people to also choose who they want to learn about. But I think it needs to be a year-wide, ongoing dedication. Of learning and a month is not enough. I do a lot of work with children, and that's one of my key focus, especially with the augmented reality piece that I'm working on, because children are so tech savvy nowadays. And so, I wanted to use the augmented reality to further encourage education and to create learning about Black and contributions of Black Canadians to the Canadian landscape more engaging and fun. The augmented reality piece that I'm working on is almost like a game, learning about the ancestors, Emperor Haile Selassie. So important, you know. I mean, Akuma, a lot of these folks. So I can quickly show y'all the video of the augmented reality piece that I'm working on. I think how cool that's going to be that your work is going to be seen by a new generation of young children of color actually seeing themselves represented. That's so important. Absolutely. In terms of affirmation of person.、Mm-hmm. Absolutely.、So、you're definitely onto something there. Thank you. Just quickly play this video. So one video is by my friend who I collaborated with. His name is Vince Fraser, super dope artist from the UK. The other one is the one I'm working on right now. Something I'm working on that is going to be released by the City of Toronto, and when you press on it, it will take like each time you click it, it will show you a different black leader. And this is another one that's with、uh, the Guta Institute.
It's in the streets of Montreal. It's called the Ancestral Technofossil. I really like the idea of using the augmented reality to bring this stuff to a location. It allows you to kind of do an end run around dealing with city councils and mayors, and you can make that stuff happen and do installations virtually anywhere you want. Absolutely. So how did you get to work with the city? Thank you for the question. So I got to work with the city because they just reached out to me. There was a competition, a call out for the competition, and I responded to the competition. I submitted my work. Yeah, the thing I know, they announced that I was the winner of the competition. But this, I was, I've been working with the city a few times because of all the programs and projects that I've been doing. And also I've done quite a few murals. Actually, one of the videos I wanted to show was one of the first murals I did back in 2009 when I was working with youth from the junction. And then this, the third video I was going to show you was um, another interview where I was working with youth from Lawrence Heights when I was working on the mural that was at Yorkdale. If anyone been to Yorkdale, to the subway at Yorkdale, there's like the pillars outside, the pickup area outside of the subway. But yeah, back in 2010, 2011, I worked with seven youth to create that art piece. I mean, I was a youth too, so I'm speaking like I wasn't a youth, but they were fairly young and they were high school kids. And that was actually, that was one of my most memorable monuments. I mean, sorry, uh, public art pieces that I've did because of the impact on one particular individual. And I'm going to tell you the quick story. So quick story is we're painting and I realized I really think cross-generation is important. Like cross-generation um, connection is important, especially coming from a place where connecting to your ancestors and elders is, is highly revered, especially within the Rasta community and Jamaican culture, you know, paying respect to your elders. And um, I realized in the mural, we didn't have enough elders. Oh, man. It would be great to have someone, a black person, who uh, lived here for a long time to be in this mural, like, you know, like to be a part of this mural. And literally, as I said it, I looked over my shoulder and there was this guy walking and he's smiling and he's whistling. And he's just like, just like, man, just like such a good vibe. Like, he looked like he came out of like a jazz movie, like Oscar Peterson's like pal or something, you know? And uh, he had like the, the straps, I don't know what you call them the straps and he just walking he just had a whole rhythm like so jazzy i stopped this i stopped him like excuse me sir excuse me yeah the braces i, I stopped him like, like i was like excuse me like um by any chance are you from the lawrence heights neighborhood from neptune he's like ah yeah i've been here for 50 years and now oh, i've saw so many changes and he starts telling us stories and i'm like oh whoa this is the guy in my mind i'm like this is the guy so he starts talking and then like i'm like yo is it possible would you be interested like can we have you in the mural like can we take a picture and put you in the mural he's like ah no problem man that'll be i'll be honored you know and so uh he had a cigarette in his hand and he was about to smoke the cigarette and i'm like oh can you like it's okay if we ditch the cigarette you know just just be natural he's like ah no problem he throws away the cigarette he's like i don't even like smoking anyways he takes a picture and then he basically like just leans back and smiles and it's like an amazing smile. His name is Felix. Boom, we, everyone was excited about putting him in, in the mural because it was just like perfect. And then he told us about another elder who also used to do barbecues in the community. And so we put her in the mural and that was amazing. So opening day, he comes and he has all his grandkids with him, like about maybe about like 12 little kids, like grandkids and then the adults with him. And we didn't see him for a while. And he, He's like, yo, you know what? I have to thank you. And I'm like, for what? And he's like, yo, you saved my life. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm so confused. Like, how can I save this old man's life just by having him in the mirror? And he says to me, that day he was told that he had terminal cancer in his lungs. And the doctor told him the next cigarette that he would smoke could kill him. And just as he was about to take the drag of his last cigarette, ready to kill himself essentially i stopped him not knowing that like me asking him to take that picture gave him a reason to fight and to live he went on to live for a couple more years and he passed away but his family was so grateful like for a very long time they actually held a memorial at the at the mural you know his grandkids 
and his great grandkid. Yeah, that was. I'm sorry, I get emotional talking about it because it's like to know that art can do that for someone, and then also for the grandkids to see their grandfather's story being preserved. You know, made me realize I was making the right choice to be an artist and to continue to tell these stories because it's not about me. It's more the next generation. That mural always will be a huge reminder of why I do what I do. Even though the mural is falling apart, I still got pictures of it. I still keep in touch with the, with the family as well from time to time. They always, always, always thank me for, for that mural. And I'm just like, man, sometimes it's so important to listen to your intuition. And I'm glad that, that I did. Wow, that was a fantastic story. That was incredible. I remember when you were working on that. Oh, Chilina had her kids watching. She's very glad that yeah. to watch. That's awesome. Thank you. We're so blessed to have had you here today, Quentin. And I think I can say on behalf of everyone, uh, it was really eye-opening. It was inspirational. And I'm sure this really resonated with a lot of people here in the room today. Thank you so much.